everybody, welcome to today's event, the new impact of Taiwan Renewable Energy organized by TITRA. This is Guang Ying Lu, your host today. I'm a senior writer of Commonwealth Magazine Taiwan. Climate change is affecting every aspect of life, from industrial development and manufacturing to electricity use, transportation and even our dinner tables. The threat it poses has sparked urgent appeals for a transition to a net zero emissions world. Taiwan is on the crossroads of energy transition, with 98% of energy imported from overseas and over 80% of its electricity generated from fossil fuel sources. Energy independence, as well as decarbonization of the grid, are of crucial importance in order for Taiwan to secure a sustainable economy and future for all mankind. Taiwan has set an ambitious goal to increase the percentage of renewables in its energy mix from 6% now to 20% by 2025. Meanwhile, a handful of companies have also announced their targets to use 100% renewables as early as 2030. Many of them have been investing heavily in renewables, not only because they're required by the big clients, but also because it makes economic sense. In the first part of today's program, we are happy to feature three prominent players in Taiwan's booming renewable energy scene to talk about how solar, offshore wind, and energy storage each plays a part in Taiwan's energy transition and the opportunities for international alliance. In the second part, we have a representative from Taiwan External Trade Development Council, TITRA, to introduce their upcoming exhibition. So first of all, let us welcome our first speaker, Joshua Tong, the chairman of Sunrise Corporation, a prominent manufacturer of floating solar farm solutions. He will talk about the company's creative products and solution on combining solar power with aquaculture. Let's welcome him. Thanks of all coming on with the magazine for giving Sunrise ENT Corporation this opportunity of interview. I'm Joshua Tong, chairman of Sunrise. Speaking of Sunrise, I will say it's a story from follow the trader of market to become leader the trader of the world. South Taiwan is always a serial area for industry settlement due to geographic relation. Sunrise founded in 1995 and the following the trader of market to supply HDP pipe and the assembly parts for industry and the environmental engineering use. After a decade of team effort, we provide product to a wide range of industry and has established a reputation as stable and high quality supply. Until today, we involve in many kinds of projects, such as air conditioning, cooling water system, submarine piping, water drainage, electric power supply, telecommunication, irrigation system, gas supply, HDD, offshore wind power plant, fish cage, floating solar, and so on. Innovation is our soul. For example, developmental HDPE, potential pipe for step cable bridge. This produce content high technology, which only few factories are able to product around the world. Sunrise is one of its and the, is the only one in Taiwan. In year 1999, the key year for Sunrise to expand our new product line with excellence project 
experience, strong background, many things and engineering and few investment on R&D. We successfully development of shore fish cage and it has become one of the key to our stable renew today. It is worth mentioning that we are currently only overseas manufacturer that can sell fish cage to the large fish cage farming country, Norway. Taking advantage to pass over 10 years engineering experience and the success of the fish cage system for inspection. We developed the first floating solar system in year 2010. Three years later, first one megawatt project in Japan Nala successfully installed. This maker sunrise become the pioneer of floating solar, which also opened the door leading the world trade. Floating solar began around year 2013. Same year, also our first installed project. Until 2020, total install capacity reached 2 gigawatt worldwide. Most of project will step up in Asia, around 1.8 gigawatt has been operated in countries like Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, and China. Today, there are several new planning projects, which over 50 megawatts are mostly located in Southeast Asia. Moreover, include Europe, America and the Middle East are already under development of floating solar project. According to World Bank report in 2018, where some water, were taken global water bodies into account, this means only artificial disabled and the dam will include in assuming only 1% of floating solar system will be installed on that water body. The capacity worldwide will reach up to 400 gigawatt. And this figure does not include the calculator of the official solar system. From here, we can easily see that follow-up of floating solar market can be expected. What is the advantage of floating solar system? People will ask. I saw that most advantage of floating solar will be saving land usual. Traditional solar farm is built on land base. Yet, land usually is one of major issue. On the other hand, we put in solar farm onto water surface. It saves land and the proper use of idle space. This advantage will be few in some countries which with the limited then area. We are putting floating solar system at the reservoir, especially 
in a hydroelectric power plant. This solar system, in addition to effective supplementing the shortcoming of power generation during daytime, also due to advantage of system covered water surface. It can provide the partial sub suspension effect for water evaporation. Moreover, the cell chips have reported that if solar module installed on water surface are about 10% high, in power generation efficiency that then best solar system due to the cooling effect. Our solar floating platform made with virgin HDPE, PE100 material, or a long lasting material of usage over 25 years. It's Production free and the both function and the recycling stage, non impact of water quality, good as the resistance and the alkali resistance, strong in tension, strain, and the corrosion proof. The floating platform from use. Passes by combination of extrusion pipe and the ejection bracket compared to below molding flood. Our structure is much stronger and durable. In addition, integrating our floating structure to a prepared anchoring molding system will be certainly increase stability and the strength of overall system become of this unique design. We obtain the invention pattern in 46 countries worldwide. Sunrise floating solar system in complete constructed according to customer need. And we also provide morning design that meets said requirement. The high strength system complete with a proper litter, buoyancy and a stable encourage have not only passed Japan winter no test but also safety past test of several large typhoon in our domestic and foreign installation project. So far the install capacity of our floating solar system which in operation has exceeded 100 megawatt. In response to future demand, we increased production capacity to 600 megawatt only in this year. However, the pace of development never stopped. According to the Center International Solar Energy Project, next generation module use have exceeded 500 watt. Of course, larger the power generation, larger the relative weight and the size of module. So the size and the buoyancy of flutter design in the patterns are 
technology, applicator. Fortunately, our system has always main customer size. Continue change and evolution is what we are best at. Therefore, at the end of last year, we start to plan the next generation module floating system. Additionally, offshore solar system could be next particular market. A it requires high technical content. This also shows the advantage of Sunrise. Because of our experience in official construction of fish cage, therefore, we expect to launch two new product lines including next generation module, floats and the official solar system. In end of this year, we look forward to continue to land the market. As Sunrise now is a listed company at in managing stock market with higher production capacity and the now product line plan are almost complete. We expect to be able to reach international market more deeply in the future. We said increasing visibility we will actively participate in large international energy organization to obtain more export order. Sunrise has always followed development paths of sustainable symbiosis and the green energy development, such as replacing fishing with fish cage, aquaculture fishes, or expanding floating solar energy to create pollution free power generation system, and at the same time not after, then use. Hoping that in the future, as so as possibly to protect our Earth and possibly slow down consumption of natural resources. Our next speaker is TF Xie, Xie Dongfu, General Manager of Sysgration Limited a market leader in smart energy storage. He will talk about the crucial role energy storage plays in decarbonizing the electricity grid while maintaining system stability. When electric vehicle adoption becomes a fast-growing trend all over the world. Let's welcome him. Hey, everybody. This is Tia from Sysgration Limited. We are a design manufacturing company focusing on industrial power energy products, and also automotive electronics. We are 44 years old, and we have a factory in Taiwan and China. Today, we are going to talk about the ESS solution for renew renewable energy, especially in smart grid applications. So I will cover the benefits of smart grid how can it be beneficial to our green environment? Then I will talk about what's the importance of the ESS feature in the smart grid application. Then we will talk about what's Sysgration's ESS solutions for this kind of smart grid application. Then I will conclude by talking about Sysgration's commitment about the green environment. 
First of all, uh, we know the environment has been coming with a lot of toxic air, a lot of hazard substance in the past year, mostly because of our growing factory, industry, and recently also include the electric vehicles. So our environment is now full of different kind of material harmful to human beings. A lot of countries have been start to focus on renewable energy from many years ago and the energy mostly include the solar energy, the hydro energy, the different kind of energy which will not be harmful to the environment. So right now, a lot of new energy, renewable energy will be good to everybody's life. We can improve our daily life, but in the meantime, we can maintain a good environment for our generations. Like in Taiwan, the government's goal for year 2025, we like to reach around 20% of our renewable energy for the total power capacity. For the renewable energy, actually they will be include the solar power, the biomass power, the wind power, the hydropower, and geothermal and so on. So by applying this kind of renewable energy, it will be good to our environment. So roughly speaking, for the daily life in the city, in our home, in the factory, actually the power can be coming from the traditional thermal power, the nuclear power, plus the renewable energy like the hydropower, like the solar power and wind power. So how to distribute and transmit this kind of different power, including the traditional power plus the renewable energy power will become a important topic. How to transmit, how to distribute from different kind of power sources to different kind of demands. So this is the definition of the smart grid, how to transmit, how to allocate among different sources to the different demand. In this kind of application, actually, there are two major topics which we will need to think about. One of them is the renewable energy may not be available anytime when we need it. It's not a power on demand, just like some of the superheroes in some movies just get the power by one single click. Actually, just like a solar power, when in the daytime, the power from the solar resources, it will be very strong, very efficient. However, when everybody go home during the nighttime, the solar power is not as strong as what we have in the daytime. So how to store or how to reshape the power supply between daytime and nighttime for the solar power become a important topic. So some people call this is kind of dark curve in the solar power application, which means when the power requirement is huge and when we have some renewable energy, we may be able to limit the supply of the regular power like from the solar power. In this case, we can save the environmental pollution and also we can offer the best use of the renewable energies. So this is one topic which we need to study for the renewable energy. The second one is when everybody go into the office, when everybody turn on the computer, from the power plant viewpoint, there will be some short period of time with a high spike. Everybody get demand on the power. So for the power plant, the supply power of the frequency may become very low because of the demand become very high. So you can see from the photo on the screen that when the load is very high, the frequency of the supply can be, become much lower. On the other hand, if the load is lighter and the frequency of the power can become higher, 
what does it matter if the frequency become higher or lower? Actually, for most of the system design in the industry, if the AC power is not stable within a certain frequency range, most of the system may stop. Then everybody's life will be impact. So how to control the frequency of the AC power become an important topic for the renewable energy. So the importance of ESS system was introduced based on this kind of concept. Roughly speaking, a ESS means the energy storage system, which is very similar to the water reservoir or the water tower in our office or in our community. When we need some, a lot of water for irrigation, actually, we need some power from the, we need some water from the water dam to fertilize our farm. However, when there are some flood coming in, we don't like the flood to damage our farm. So the water reservoir or the water tower is used in our daily life for this kind of store, storage, or to smooth or to coordinating our daily water source. So for ESS, the energy storage system is used in the smart grid as a similar function. For example, when the solar power is very strong, but we don't need that much of the power, actually we can store the power from the solar or from the wind power into the ESS so that when we need it in the night time or when we need it at some special period or some special area, we can restore the power from the ESS so that we don't need to invest so many facilities to support our daily life. Or we can make the best adjustment of the power supply when we really need it. So roughly speaking for the ESS, the key functions for ESS in the smart grid application, the key functions are to store, to smooth, or to coordinate different power sources just like what we see from the previous page, the ESS can be used to store the power from different traditional thermal power or from the renewable power and then allocate the power sources to different demand area, to factory, to everybody's home or to some city offices. So this is the key functions of the renewable energy ESS systems. To be more specific, we have one chart to share with you how the ESS can be used in different kind of area of the smart grid. From the smart grid viewpoint, actually there are some power plant working on the production of the power. There are some people, they are working on the transmission of the power from some area to some different area. And there are some people, they are working on the distribution from large, from small power sources to different kind of demands. And of course, we are the consumer of the power. There are some offices, there are some home users, there are some factory users. So different kind of consumption may have a different kind of demands for the power. And some people may want to have a mobility power, which they can have the power when they are working in some different area. For example, they may need in some construction area, they may working in some desert area, they may working in some rescue area. So there are some kind of different power for the mobility applications. So for the ESS, actually they can be used in different portion of the smart grid to offer different kind of functions for different kind of purpose. And you can see from the chart, actually for a different kind of application in the smart grid uh, distribution. For the power plant, mostly the ESS storage need to be ranged from one megawatt to 10 megawatts or even higher. For the transmission, the range of the storage system can be a little bit smaller. And going to the consumer side, actually the range of the storage system can be 5 to 50 
kilowatts. And for mobility, they can be as small as one kilowatt or even smaller range. So the ESA system, as I just mentioned, that's very similar to the water reservoir or the water tower near the dam or the water tower near our home. For a different kind of application, we will need different kind of capacity of the ESS. So talking about this kind of ESS application in the smart grid applications, what Syscration can offer, actually, we have been working on ESS for around 10 years. We offer different kind of solutions from large capacity to medium or small size capacity. The application can be from home and business applications, from community application, or to the frequency control, as I just mentioned, to the power plant distribution applications. To be more specific, we actually have a different kind of products from higher capacity range to small one, which will be shown in the, this coming to, a, coming to page. For the first one, actually, we offer a 40-inch size container. They can offer around 2 megawatt hour for factory use or for the power plant use. It offers an air conditioner system plus the firefighting system inside. So the container can be put near the factory or near the power plant for the electro electronics or electric power distribution generation purpose. Also, we have some kind of power brick range from around uh, 100 kilowatts to 50 or something kilowatts hour. The application of this kind of power grid, a power brick, actually, for recent year, more and more people, they are afraid of kind of fire. In case there are some fire happened, they hope the power brick can be smaller enough with reasonable size. So this kind of power brick has been applied to different kind of industry. And we have a IP55 outdoor enclosure for waterproof, for dust proof. Also the power conditioner system, the PCS, air conditioner and firefighting system are built in. And this is for the power distribution like a pick, sha pick shaving or fast response resources application. For the power plant, sometimes they need to support the power for some heavy duty users like the semiconductor factories, but the investment of the power plant is fixed. So the power plant company like Taiwan Power, they may sign some contract with some enterprise. If you agree to join the fast resources, response resources project, then they will help you to install some energy storage system. In case the power plant, they need to support most of their power to semiconductor factories, then your energy storage system, your power brick can be turned on so that your office will not be impacted. While the power plant, they can offer faster support to the semiconductor factory. So this power brick is actually excellent for this kind of applications. The next, next one is a small size, just like the traditional lead acid battery, which everybody used in the automotive passenger vehicle. The size is very small and that can be used as a dropping replacement for the traditional lead acid battery. The benef benefits of this kind of Li-ion based battery is the life is much better than the traditional lead acid battery. The power density, the energy density, which means the power or the energy which can be supported for the same volume of the, the size is much higher than the traditional lead acid battery. So by applying this kind of Li-ion based, uh, Li based battery, people can consume much smaller spaces. They can consume much smaller air conditional requirement to support much better power requirement. So this kind of Li-ion based battery actually have now been applied 
to some large semiconductor fab, fab in Taiwan. So we are the number one manufacturer in Taiwan to support this kind of semiconductor applications. So this one can be dropped in replacement to the traditional lattice battery, which is very good. And among all these kind of Li-ion based energy storage systems, one of the key component is the BMS, the battery management system. The battery management system is mostly used to monitor the current, the voltage, the temperature, and the state of charge, state of the health of the Li-ion based battery. So the BMS need to be able to monitor, need to be able to calculate, and then to control or to balance the Li-ion cell within the Li-ion battery pack. So Sysgration has our own BMS, which is manufacturing, manufactured in our in-house automotive grade factory. So this is now actually used in our, all of our Li-ion based energy storage system as well. So these are the key components for our Li-ion solution applied in the energy storage system, which has been applied in a lot of smart grid applications. So to conclude my presentation, actually, as I just report to everybody, Sysgration has been working on industrial grade of energy products, also working on automotive electronics. All of our products are actually focusing on lightweight, light consumption of carbon, light consumption of the energy. So we hope our product can support the industry to make everybody's life become better and better. But in the meantime, we hope our product can help the environment to become more and more healthy, more and more green, so we can make our life even better, or we can maintain an even better environment for our next generation. Thank you for your attention. Our third speaker here is Lucas Lin. Chief Executive Officer of Swancore Renewable Energy. He will talk about his experience of tapping into the international market for offshore wind. Let's welcome Lucas. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my great honor to be here to share with you about Taiwan offshore wind farm development experience. I'm Lucas Lin, the CEO of Swancore Renewable. I think the first of all, I would like to share with you what is SRE? I think the first of all, I want to have a briefer introduction about SRE, Swango Renewable Energy. Uh, Swango Renewable Energy is the pioneer of shore wind developer in Taiwan. In the past seven years, we have completed the first demonstration wind farm. So SRE already achieved the development, construction, and currently operate the first offshore wind farm in Taiwan, that's Formosa 1, with 128 megawatt offshore wind project. And based on those successful achievements, right now we already build a quite strong and professional teams. And these teams, I believe, is the only one team in Asia who has been cooperating with lots of uh, international offshore wind contractors and especially this team is the only one team in Taiwan in Asia who understand Asia element including culture including climate or the supply chain limitation in Asia so I think this is what we can share with all of you to develop the regional offshore wind and based on those successful achievements in Formosa 1, right now we already expand our business model to onshore wind, to solar development, and also to secure the grid stability means into energy storage market. And I think Swanko Renewable SRE will become the strong peer to support Taiwan government to achieve 20% of our energy is from renewable energy. That's a SRE brief introduction. Uh, let's get to uh, our second topic, the 
achievement of Formosa One, the first demonstration wind farm in Taiwan. I think based on this a successful achievement, SRE already be the first in large of area. We build the first offshore man mast, and these man mast until now already collect for more than five years wind data, current data, or all those weight informations. So I think that will become a very strong evidence to build offshore wind in Taiwan. And of course, we build the first offshore wind in Asia. The third one is, I think we are local developer. And like I mentioned, we have been successfully to cooperate with lots of European or international sponsor and contractors. And so we are ready to share our international experience and with those local or regional developers. And of course, uh, another milestone is because this is the first project. So we successfully attained the project certification in the structure in the wind turbine. And the other item I also want to share with you is about the HSE rakers. I think Formosa One is the first offshore wind developed in Asia, but we complete the Formosa One construction within budget and within our original schedule. The most important is with excellent HSE raker. It's even far better than those European rakers. So I think that's also another achievement we have uh, built in the past seven years. And the other one is about stakeholder management. Because for offshore wind development, no matter how big your project it is, but it definitely needed to have a good cooperation with stakeholder means with central government, with local county government, even with local village or fishermen. So I think our project already win more than 70% support. I think that's a, a very great achievement in the past. About the last one, I assume that will be the most important one is project finance. I think SRE has educated the market with offshore wind project finance and to secure the first non-recourse project finance in Taiwan. Yeah, because in the past, for those lenders, for those bankers, they have no experience, no knowledge about offshore wind. So we complete the first project finance for offshore wind and we educate the market. The most important is we not only tell them the information, we also complete the project successfully. And to give the whole capital market with confidence, Taiwan can build the offshore wind project. So I think that's an achievement in our Formosa One. Based on the achievement in Formosa One, I think right now, Swango Renewable has become a full scope of developers. And what we do, that also represents the three phase or three stage of offshore wind development. The first stage is development stage. So in development stage, we focus on the EIA, grid interconnection, and of course, all of those key permits you needed to secure from the government. The second one is you needed to sign the PPA or probably you needed to negotiate the PPA with those state-owned grid company. So based on these two, I mean the permit and the PPA, you could secure your project, have long-term cash flow, then you could reach the project finance. So I think in the development stage, we focus on permit, PPA and project finance. And of course, there is a fundamental in development stage is you needed to sign or you needed to secure all of your EPC contractors. So that's the function or that's the work we done in development stage. And then you reach the project finance or you make the final investment decision that we call FID stage. Then your project enter into construction phase. During the construction stage, I think because you already novate or award a several EPC contractor. 
So in this stage, I think the most important rule is about management. To manage your EPC contract, to manage your contract, to control the schedule. And if you could achieve that three goals, then your budget will be well management. And of course, there is also some stakeholder management. For example, you needed to deal with the local county or local fishermen. And the other thing, because most of your finance is supported by your lenders, so you also needed to continue to offer your lenders sufficient evidence you could complete that project within budget and on time. So I think that's a major task we needed to achieve during the construction stage, management. So after you complete an offshore wind farm construction, of course, SRE also could provide the service to operate the whole wind farms. Like I just shared with you, right now we operate the first and only offshore wind farm in Taiwan. So we are capable to offer the BOP maintenance and we are able to deal with the wind turbine company to make sure they offer good service, to make sure your whole wind farm achieve good performance. And the other point is about quality and HSE. And of course, like I mentioned, because your finance is based on project finance, so you still needed to continue to communicate with all of your lenders and EIA or to offer the regular EIA support to the EPA or even to the local county is also extremely important. So during the O&M phase, like I mentioned, we are able to offer the technical support, financial support, and also stakeholder management. I think that's a three stage we could offer to all of our partners. SRE is capable to do the development, construction, and O&M service to build the whole wind farm and to make sure a wind farm could perform more than 20, 25, even longer than 30 years to guarantee you have a good investment, you could achieve some kind of success in renewable energy industries. So I think based on what we have done, or based on our successful track record in offshore wind, so right now SRE also built up our long-term pipeline. So right now we have Formosa 1 under operation, that's 128 megawatt project. And our Formosa 2, that's 376 megawatt project is under construction. And we also have a quite a big project, that's Formosa 4. It's 4.4 gigawatt, it's in development. So I think our project or our pipeline is reached to three stages, like I just shared with you, in operation, under construction, or in development stage. I think those experience is definitely we could share with all of those regional or international players. No matter you are in which stage, we have the similar project linked to what you are doing right now. And we definitely have our knowledge or experience to share with you. The other thing linked to technical side is our Formosa 1. The foundation is fixed foundation and monopile. And Formosa 2, the foundation is jacket foundation. And our Formosa 4, it could be fixed foundation by jacket or it could be floating foundations. So that means in our project, it also touch several different technology, model pile, jacket, and future floating wind farm technologies. So like I share with you in SRE pipeline, we are able to share with you based on different stage, operation, construction, and development stage. And our project also use different kinds of foundation technology, moral pile technology, jacket technology, or the future floating technologies. 
So SRE aspired to be a leading renewable energy company across Asia. That's our target. That's also I want to share with you or partner with you in the future's project developments. So I think that's a link to SRE's pipeline. So the second part I want to share with you is about Taiwan Offshore Wind successful experience. And based on those successful experience, I think there are some key successful factors we want to share with you. The first of all is project executions. So SRE already have experienced and stable project team to execute a project. And like I share with you, the risk and the interface management is extremely important. And the other one to make sure your project could be executed on time within budget is your HSE strategies. So we have learned or we also change or modify telemate our HAC strategy to feed for Asia cultures. So I think that's the first part about project execution. The second one I want to share with you is about project permit. You needed to secure your PPA. You needed to confirm the grid connection. It also needed to get the EI approval. I think that's a fundamental permit you needed to have. The second one is for the project finance. I think we complete the first offshore wind project finance comprised with equitable principle. I think that's another new principles we apply for project finance. So for the project permit, yeah, there's a two things. The government permit, one thing. The other is the request from the lenders we also have the experience to share with you. The third key successful factor is about the project economy. So there are two signs. One is about the income, about revenue. So you need to have very strong AEP result. You need to have very good energy year assessment to make sure you could guarantee your cash flow. That's one thing. The other side is about the cost. So you also needed to have a comprehensive capex and opex assumption. So it will make the investor and lenders feel comfortable to secure your project. That's a, a good business case. And the fourth key successful factor is about the project designs, like your site condition. And the other special factor I would like to suggest those Asia developers to consider is about seismic, about earthquake. Because offshore wind is oriented from Europe, but they don't have such kind of issues. So seismic is also another special knowledge we have built in the past. And then the main ocean data, I need to admit is in Asia Pacific, the current is much stronger than in Europe, in America. So to have a very detailed main ocean data, that will definitely to secure your project successfully in the future. And the last point I want to mention is about the project contract. Like I mentioned, you have several different ETC contracts. So you needed to have a very good contractor a strategy and then to select your major contractor with strong trade breakers and that will guarantee your project will be successful in the future. So I think those five key successful factors as I want to share with all of you. So I think there is also some a special factor I suggest those regional developers to consider. One is about HSE. The other one is about interface risk. The third one is about site suitability or the spatial weather conditions we needed to consider. And the other factor is about the stakeholder. Due to different culture, due to different environment, so I think for the stakeholder management is also extremely important in Asia to develop an offshore wind. And the other two points is localization or auction-based 
So because every government they have a different strategy. So SRE also have a strong strength in localization and about the auction knowledge. Uh, these are major six different factors we need to consider in Asia to deliver an offshore wind. And the last section I want to touch is Taiwan aspired to be green energy hub of Asia Pacific. So in order to achieve these goals, I think the Taiwan government also has a strong policy to build the Taiwan offshore wind supply chains. So in order to achieve this supply chain, in order to build the Taiwan offshore supply chains, SRE also have a lot of action we have taken in the past to secure our domestic resources to support our project. And there are six stages I also want to share with you. The first thing you need to check, what is your domestic supply chain? The secondly, you should be able to filter to understand what is their capability. And then the third one, you needed to bring in the local contractor, local player, and to cooperate with international player. And on the other hand, you also needed to request your international partner to cooperate with the local suppliers. And then we also suggest you to have some cooperation with campers. Then you could make your knowledge, your engineering to build in the university. So in the long run, you could build a domestic O&M resources. And then you could secure your offshore wind development capacity within your country. So I think that's a sixth stage I want to share with you. And that's also Taiwan government is doing right now. And as you can see, Taiwan government also have acquired long-term plan from year 2021, from this year until 2025, based on different stage, and we will build the offshore wind supply chain in Taiwan by 2025. So that's a Taiwan offshore wind supply chain. And the last point, uh, I already shared with you is about the supply chain management and you also could be very three important stage supplier selection and then you needed to award a right contractor so you will touch the contract negotiation with preferred contractor and also you needed to build on acquire high levels employer requirement. So you could build your inspection and acceptance criteria. And in the final, definitely your team must be capable to review and maintain the whole wind farms. So I think that's a four major stage about supply chain management in Taiwan. And of course, we are able to share in across the whole Asia. I think that's a three major section I share with you. Introduce SRE and the first demonstration wind farm in Taiwan. The second three stage of developing an offshore wind farm, including development stage, construction, and O&M stage. And in the final, I also encourage you to build your own supply chain in your country. But before you have that, definitely, Taiwan Can Help is not only used for face masks. Taiwan Can Help also could be used in offshore wind development. We have our development knowledge here. We already build offshore wind supply chain in Taiwan. So we are here ready to cooperate with all those international sponsors to develop your own project in your countries. Thanks. Our last speaker here is Carol Zhang, Project Manager of Taiwan External Trade Development Council, TITRA. She will tell us about the upcoming exhibition later this year. Let's welcome Carol. 
Hi, this is Carol from Tytra. Today, I would like to take this opportunity to elaborate more about the renewable energy industry here in Taiwan, and it will include about the industrial development and also the government policy as well. Furthermore, I will give you a brief introduction about all the renewable energy related trade shows here in Taiwan. This B2B business platform can help you to seize the business opportunity here. So no matter you want to go into this market or trying to find a partner to cooperate with in the future. So how's the renewable energy development here in Taiwan? Taiwan is a small island with a central mountain range covering two-thirds of the total area and also lacks of resources to generate electricity. According to the Bureau of Energy, in 2020, Taiwan imported almost 98% of its total energy supply. Therefore, it is really important to stop relying on importing fossil fuels and be independent on the energy supply. The development of renewable energy in Taiwan has gone through many phases, and the government making the policy according to some geographical advantages of Taiwan. The first one is that according to 4C Offshore, 16 of the world's 20 most ideal wind sites are located in the Taiwan Strait. So Taiwan offshore wind power has significant potential. And Taiwan has also high solar irradiance, which is good for generating solar power. So last summer, solar PV power generation in the country peaked at 2.3 gigawatt in just one day, surpassing any of Taiwan's nuclear power plants due to the hot weather. So it is a really good environment to develop the PV industry, which leads Taiwan become the second largest PV cell manufacturer. And besides, as the tech giants go green, the suppliers must step up to their game. Taiwan is closely connected with the global manufacturing supply chain. So tech giants such as Google or Apple have joined the RE100, and they've made commitments to consume only renewable energy. So now their suppliers, such as those in Taiwan, have to use green energy during the production. And by 2025, the power generated by nuclear should be decreased to 0% in Taiwan, and the renewable energy should be taken up to 20%. In order to achieve this goal, Taiwan government has made some changes regarding to the policy. In 2019, the government set a solar target of 6.5 gigawatt in cumulative install capacity by the end of 2020. However, a review of the progress in the installations of new PV systems across the island during the 2020 finds that quite a few solar projects were delayed due to the unfavorable changes in the land use regulations and lack of distribution lines for grid connections. So now the government says that the previous targets will be reached later in the first quarter of 2021. Moreover, the government announced a new target of 8.3 quarter gigawatt in cumulative install capacity for 2021. And various ministries and agencies will be working together to take inventory of the available land or spaces that can be used for installations of the new PV systems. So places that are under consideration include like roof of the agriculture, manufacturing, or the public facilities. So there are also initiatives to install PV system above the fish bound, uh, which is called the aquafortex. So aquafortex will be built above the major harbors or uh, and on the lands that are heavily polluted. So as for the offshore wind energy, the capacity of the wind farm is projected to reach 5.7 gigawatt by 2025. So that is accounting for the 8.4% of the domestic renewable energy. The overall project will bring investments uh, over one trillion NT dollar, as well um, twenty thousand new jobs to be expected. And while Taiwan is fulfilling the 2025 target on schedule, and now we are planning for the next 10-year stage until 2035. And Taiwan Ministry of Economic Affairs plan a new target to develop a further 10 gigawatts of sh offshore wind capacity between 2026 to 2035. The energy plan is expected in the short term to solidify the industry foundations. And this efforts will promote energy diversification and self-sufficiency, spur domestic demand and job growth, and create a friendly environment for overall the energy development. So compared to 2019, the power generations of solar and wind grew steadily at 2020. Still, the major power generation is from the thermal power, so which is something we can improve in the future. And if we break down Taiwan's renewable electricity by percentage, during 2020, the renewable electricity percentage decreased a little bit compared to last year. Because of the lack of water, it caused a huge decrease in the hydropower. 
But if we just consider the solar and wind power, these two takes up around 4% and which is a huge increase compared to the last year. So from this data, you can see there are huge potentials of developing the renewable energy in Taiwan, especially in the wind and solar power. So now I will briefly introduce about the PV supply chain here in Taiwan. Taiwan's PV industry from upstream to downstream of the supply chain is divided into five major aspects. So in the past, silicon cell manufacturing was one of the Taiwan's major competitive advantages. And the market share was rapidly expanded via the, because of the foundry module. So in the recent years, with the rapid rise of the solar PV um, production capacity of China, the Taiwanese company has um, extended their business model to include like the downstream module assembly. So such, ch uh, such changes has resulted in a close alliance between the battery and the module ma manufacturers in here in Taiwan and allows them to quickly extend their business operation coverage to the fields of domestic and foreign system establishment projects. And Taiwan now is uh, actively pursuing the development of, uh, of the high potential offshore wind power sites. In January 2018, the Industrial Development Bureau issued the Offshore Wind Power Industry with Re Relevance Implementation Program Proposal Structure Guide. The goal is expected to drive the development of local procurement markets for certain components and creating a market demand for green energy. The goal is challenged, but with the right quality and competitive cost level, Taiwan can meet its policy objective to become an Asian offshore wind hub for the Asian Pacific, as offshore wind will grow dramatically here. So, so far, Taiwan has many excellent local suppliers working with all the developers, so we expect more cooperation to come in the near future. So the complete upstream industry lays a good ground for Taiwan to achieve supply chain localization and reduce costs for the developers. So from the figures here, you can see that every part of the wind turbine, you can find the local supplier to complete the project. So how do we go into Taiwan renewable energy market? Taiwan has excellent transportation infrastructures and buyers visiting Taiwan and have easy access to, um, to all the industrial cluster around the island with just a journey of two hours on the Taiwan high speed rail. And Taiwan's experience and efficient surface team have attracted many international exhibitions to the island. So the island is actually already home to some major events. These trade shows provide the best platform for trading and sourcing business opportunities, attracting international buyers to visit every year. So today, I will take this chance to introduce four related trade shows here in Taiwan in chronological order. The first one is Taiwan International Water Week, TIWW, and Energy Taiwan. These two trade shows will be held at this October. The third one is TUS, which will be held at this November. Last but not least, Wind Energy Asia will be held at next March. So water is basic but essential, not only for your life, but also for the manufacturing or industrial use. Even nowadays, many countries are still fighting for water shortage or pollution problem. The third Taiwan International Water Week, TIWW, is the only one water-related professional B2B exhibition in Taiwan and provides um, excellent and diverse platform to gather related buyers, experts, and participants from the global water industry to share the best innovative water solutions. The exhibition products will cover reclaimed water treatments, green infrastructures, purification equipment, process control technology, and process automa uh, automation. And the three-day event will showcase the latest technologies and tap business opportunities. TIWW will be held from October 14th to 16th at Taiwan World Trade Center Hall 1. And let's take a look at their 2020 post-show video. Gathering elite companies from across the industry to showcase water technologies and trends in green energy. The Taiwan International Water Week and Circular Economy Taiwan is a must-go event for professionals and buyers. Due to the ongoing pandemic, the 2020 show relied on video conferencing to connect foreign buyers and domestic companies. Online interaction became the means to demonstrate the strengths of made in Taiwan products. During September 23rd to 25th, 
the MOEA's Water Resources Agency hosted a number of forums and symposiums. Through video conferencing, domestic and foreign experts and scholars discussed ways on the cultural, environmental, urban and industrial fronts to promote sustainable use of water resources in the midst of climate change. Over the course of the show, there were also a number of product presentations. In total, thousands of domestic professionals attended these events. We look forward to your return to the Taiwan International Water Week and Circular Economy Taiwan in 2021. Energy Taiwan is a comprehensive show in energy industry. It focuses on four energy themes, PV power, wind energy, hydrogen energy, and smart storage to offer numerous business opportunities for you. So from manufacturing to service with energy integrations, we believe that Energy Taiwan will give the industrial insiders a better platform for networking. And Energy Taiwan attracts the most influential and important buyers here. So last year, Energy Taiwan attracts 123 exhibitors using more than 500 booths to promote their products and over 13,000 visitors to find a business opportunity here in the show. So you can find all the major industrial players during the event, such as TSEC, URE, WPD, CIP, and so on. So Energy Taiwan will be held from October 27th to 29th at Taipei Nangang Exhibition Center Hall 1. And let's take a look at their 2020 post-show video.我想這個展示一個台灣最大的一個再生能源展我是只有focus在太陽能啦大概是綠能裡面的幾家幾個重要的廠商都會來參展所以對於整個台灣綠能產業大家業內的交流互動是更方便的更頻繁的因为台湾的光电业跟绿能逐渐在发展那参加台湾的一个绿能的光电事业是一个非常重要的去传达一些研发的精神及未来的产品发展方向就是说这是来参展的参展商很多像太阳能发电然后离岸风电然后各种不同
Offshore wind energy industry is now a major he issue here in Taiwan. Wind Energy Asia is Taiwan's largest wind energy show, so dedicated to building the Taiwan supply chain. For WEA 2021, 200 exhibitors have met about more than 2,000 visitors in Kaohsiung and amid the Taiwan's developing the wind industry. And WEA will be held from March 9th to 11th at the Kaohsiung Exhibition Center next year. And because of the pandemic, many trade shows have launched its online edition. So you can scan the QR codes on the slide to find more information from their website. And I hope to see you soon, no matter online or offline. Thank you so much. That's all for today. Thanks for your participation from all over the world. We look forward to working together with you in the near future. Have a nice day and see you next time. Bye-bye.